Welcome back to the Ink and Impact podcast. And today I am absolutely thrilled to have a guest author with us today, um, Douglas Bond. He is the author of more than 30 books of historical fiction, biography, devotion, and practical theology. Bond is director of the Oxford Creative Writing Masterclass and the Carolina Creative Writing Masterclass. He has served as adjunct instructor in church history and creative writing at three institutions of higher learning and leads church history tours in Europe. He is the father of six children and 11 and counting grandchildren. So welcome, Douglas. I'm so glad to have you today. It's a delight to be here. Thank you, Delaine. Yeah. Oh, and church history tours in Europe sound fabulous. So yeah. may maybe one day we'll have you back and talk about that. Okay. <laughs> but today, um, since you're our first time guest on the show, I always love to ask our guests, what is one book in addition to the Bible that has significantly impacted you in some way? It's very hard to narrow that down. Um, I, I can say that as a, as a boy, I remember my mother, who has a marvelous reading voice, and all oh, my dad was dyslexic, and he read one word at a time, and a uh, wonderful, wonderful man, but, and I got to appreciate the Bible more, because he read one word at a time, when he mm -hmm. read the Bible, out loud. and uh, that um, has had a huge impact on me. Um, but my mom would read all kinds of things. She would read Shakespeare when I'm 10. I hardly understand any, you know, any of what she, if we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country laws, but if to live the greatest, it thrilled me, you know. And then she would, she, she was a, she was an English major. And then she did her master's degree in English as well as another one in counseling and, and so forth. But, um, and she, um, she loved the literature. I remember sitting on the couch, listening to her uh, read uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, you know, uh, Oh no, the problem with the short suit, the drug at the pierced to the root. And I'm like, I don't understand a word of this, but it's so wonderful. You know, snuggled up next to my mom. And uh, so those were huge impacts on me. Uh, those uh, and so many others I could list out. The Pilgrim Progress and Tom Bunyan, um, huge impact. Um, just his life, you know, how God, this is how God works, right? He, yes. Hey, we got an elder, we got a younger brother right in the opening pages of Genesis, you know, and here's, here's a guy who is the least likely to succeed as an author. And he writes the book that is, you know, been uh, second only to the English Bible. And uh, it's the publishing phenomenon of the English speaking world. Um, J.K. Rowling, step aside. You had to write yes. seven books to get up there, right? You know? Right. <laughs> So those would be huge, and I could go on and on. You know, uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe. Oh, I got on a kick reading. We read aloud in, in our home constantly, and reading aloud with my younger kids, and and then even as they were teens and all that. Uh, you know, it's it's poetry and prose, and just so earthy and just marvelous stuff. Forty-seven books from her. Also, at least likely to to succeed as an author person too. She had a lot, a lot of chronic pain, was in a wheelchair for most of her life and and uh, and yet wrote these marvelous, marvelous, you know, Eagle of the Ninth and all the rest. But so oh, I'll stop. You said no, blind and I already cheated. I don't know. So that's perfectly fine. I'm so glad that you shared that. And I loved how your mom started the tradition for you of reading out loud oh, and i know i always enjoyed reading out loud to my children when they're young but i've kind of gotten out of the habit and now you're encouraging me maybe i'll start reading out loud again yeah, yeah, well it's tough when they're teenagers they got all kinds of things going it's hard to get you know the whole clan together and so you just do with you know if, if, if only one cow comes in you feed them right you know? right so anyway, sit down. Oh, that's great well so as writers we know that each book that we create comes with its own set of challenges, um, but none more so than our very first book. So I was wondering if you could share what the biggest challenge you had to come overcome was when you were writing and publishing your very first book. Yeah, I would say probably uh, fear, although fear isn't really strong enough, probably terror, you know, was the uh, thing to overcome because, you know, uh, I was I was actually I mean it was a high school classical Christian school high school English and history teacher and I was actually editing some work for two of my colleagues at the time, um, both of whom are, are published authors and um, <clears throat> and as I was editing theirs and reading them making suggestions and all and uh, I thought you oh, know oh, if these guys can do this so can I you know and I and and then I had the the terror though of thinking okay so let's say. Uh, you know, you, you write it, 
or you write part of it and then you write a synopsis and then you start submitting it. This is like 22 years ago, 23 years ago. actually. Um, and uh, back then, uh, pre 9-11, there were a lot more publishers, Christian publishing houses that would take unsolicited manuscripts. Uh, since then, there's a lot fewer of them. But if, yes. but again, as your uh, podcast has has honed in on so ably, um, uh, independent publishing is now really the phenomenon. And it's some you know I get emails and questions from various aspiring writers and all, and I say don't you know, don't don't turn your nose up at independent publishing. Um, it's it's probably the way of the future, um, especially when you do the math and and look at the resources that are available to you. Uh, to to launch into that. Well, I didn't go that route initially. Um, I actually sent it off to some of the same ones that my colleagues had sent the manuscript off to. I was only halfway done, finished with it. Okay. And, um, you know, eight days later, I got a phone call from uh, one of the uh, eight publishers. I ended up having three of the publishers very interested in what, what I was doing. And also being a rookie, not knowing what's going on, you're just all Twitter paid and excited. Oh, you know, I heard back from these people. Oh, you know, and you you don't think very clearly and you don't pause and you know read the fine print and some of those things on contracts and stuff. So um, if I had waited six weeks, uh, my early publishing uh, would have all been under the same roof as probably I think 17 or 18 of my books now with a very wonderful uh, publishing house um, in New Jersey, PNR Publishing. But um, but um, uh, that was in the providence of God too. And um, Anyway, so I, I don't know. I think the the the, the 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 challenges are a little different now than they were 23 years ago. Um, but also the opportunities, I think, are far better now than they were 22 years ago. Um, you know, I didn't have a cell phone in my pocket 20, 23 years ago. And when I was when I got this phone call, I didn't get the phone call. You know, the secretary in the church office got or in the school office got the phone call. And she brought me a yellow, little yellow posty note while I was teaching and put it on my desk. You know, that was that was how it worked in those days. You know, and then I'm thinking, why well, can I get to a phone? You know, yeah. right? Can I ditch class? Easy. Can I go make the call now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I call now? You guys can handle this. You know, on your own. <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty exciting. But um, but again, you know, I think I would I would urge listeners um, if they're if they decide to go the traditional coaching route, you know, take some deep breaths and. Um, and ask some ask some good questions, you know, uh, be gracious and all of that, of course, as well Christians, but but also know that, you know, there's, um, yeah, you know, the publishing houses have, the, the contracts are all written in the interest of the publishing house, you know, yes. not necessarily in the interest of the author. And uh, I have a son who's now an attorney, you know, and so I know that, you know, he's looking back at some of these documents and saying, oh, my goodness, I wish I was an attorney then when those things were coming through, you know, he was, he was, you know, 13 years old or something at the time. But um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, pause, get some counsel, you know, that sort of thing. But don't, you know, snub your nose at independent publishing. At, uh, it's, a, it's a great option. And, and I guess the next part of this fear, this terror was, okay, let's say that the book, I do get a publisher and, um, you know, sign a contract, get an advance on royalties, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it comes out and it's a flop, you know. I mean, the next thing is, you know, you don't want to write a book that nobody wants to read, you know. And, um, you know, that's one of, that's, I think, uh, one of the longstanding uh, rationales behind uh, traditional publishing is there's a gatekeeper, the gatekeeper who presumably knows something about the reading public and about the industry and about what kinds of books and how to present those books and cover art and titles and all those things, how to market them and all. You know, when you're writing your first book, you have absolutely no readership. You got zero readership. You know, you don't have any trail to go back to and say, hey, there's another book. You know? um, <clears throat> as you write more and uh, and do and do trilogies and ser other kinds of series and all that. There's already a readership, presumably, that's waiting, hopefully anxiously, you know, for for the next book. You know. Yeah. Yes, so. and that is I, I, those fears are very real today as they were back then. Um, but especially when you're starting out and you're fearing, you know, well, is no, is anyone going to read my book? And you have those zero people. That's the importance of community, I think, and getting plugged into author groups, writing groups, 
Um, yeah. Just ma start making those connections um, that, that will help build your confidence and yeah. also open those doors to future readers. That's right. absolutely right. And I had the privilege just the other day, <clears throat> a friend of mine, good friend of mine, chaplain, um, <clears throat> just wrote a, a Facebook post and it was on forgiveness. And I read it and I knew what he did his doctoral studies on forgiveness, you know. So I'm reading this thing and I thought, that is so accessible. You know, academic writing is typically not something people line up to read. You know, it's written for a little handful of, of colleagues to read, yes, more or is. less, and uh, usually more than less. But um, and and I'm reading this. And I'm thinking that is so well put. It helped me. It blessed me hearing that. And and the illustrations he used and all this are just connected so well. And I, you know, messaged him back and said, "Thank you for that. It's so good. You know, I'll share it." And um, we chatted on the phone. And I was able to just, you know, open an email, go back to one of my publishers that I thought would be interested in this and say, hey, listen to this. This is this is really good material and it's so accessible and and all. And so that's part of the network, you know, yes. is that yes. once you're in the network and you've made relationships, and if you're like I am, you love those relationships and regard them, um, then you um you can help each other, you know, it's not a rivalry, you know, we're, we're in this together, you know, His, historical fiction writers shouldn't feel like, well, I don't want anybody else to read anybody else's historical fiction, no, I do, it's a great genre, you know. It, it really is. It's a marvelous yes. genre, you know, yeah. uh, Tale of Two Cities was a really, uh, you know, a landmark one for me, and, uh, and, and really a defining one of the whole genre, but, um, you know, I think it's really important to, and especially as Christians, to say, you know, we're in this together, you know, it's not just about me. It's not just about my books. It's, you know, and, and I know that's not, there is a sense of, yeah, but if they're reading those books and if they're buying those books, they might like them better than mine and then they won't read mine. And, you know, there's all those fears. But, you know, perfect love casts out fear and God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Exactly. But love sound mind. And, you know, we, we should, you know, in the body of Christ, we should be helping each other. We should be encouraging each other. And um, I don't think we do that. As well as we should. I know that I don't do that as well as I should. But you're absolutely right about community. It's mm -hmm. so essential. Absolutely. And I agree. I am a huge cheerleader of other um, writers and especially Christian writers um, and trying to get their works out and, and spread the word. And, you know, another argument for that um, is that, you know, our the readers out there, they can, they're hungry. They read a book, you know, some in a couple of days, sometimes more than one a week. And we can't write that much individually. So why not introduce them to other writers in our genre? Mm -hmm. You know? And the thing is, if we really want them, I mean, the goal of my writing, I'll just, I'll say it straight up. I have no apologies for this. I'm, um, you know, I, I don't like the adjective Christian writer because Christian works better as a noun than an adjective. I think it gets diminished as an adjective. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis says something about this. You know, we don't need uh, more Christian writers. We need more Christians who are good writers, mm. good communicators. I mean, I'm elaborating and paraphrasing here. <clears throat> Sorry, C.S. Lewis, from the grave there. Um, but, um, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, we, um, first and last, we need to write a really good yarn. That's a that's compelling, and, and there's so many different ways that we learn how to do that. Um, I, I won't launch into those at this point, but uh, there's a there's a, a number of wonderful ways to do that, and one of them is by finding other writers that have, you know, your first question, you know, other writers yes. that have inspired me. What is it about? I I started doing that with Rosemary Sutcliffe in my early writing journey. I guess I'm moving into number three here, but in my early writing journey, I realized, and this is how I taught. Uh, taught writing in as a as a classroom teacher and as a homeschool dad um, he, you know he, imitation is, is, is the best form of flattery but it also is one of the very best ways that's how that's how Ben Franklin became such a great communicator so, so witty and able to marshal words you know to do what he needed them to do by reading the spectator and reading it over and over again and and unpacking it, taking it apart and finding out how did Joseph Addison write so compellingly or Richard Steele, how did they write so compellingly or Ben Johnson or, you know, Samuel Johnson, how did they write in such a way that I can't put this down? You know? right. um, and so he began to 
imitate that. Draw out those key words, you know, what are those nouns? What are those particularly evocative descriptors that they use? And I'm just gonna write those down on a list in this paragraph, and then I'm gonna read back through it, and then I'll put it aside, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna unpack this on my own, train myself to communicate like these great communicators. It's a very biblical way to approach all of life, right? That Paul yes. also Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, you know. Um we need those connectors, you know, to the Lord Jesus. And um, so that's why I'm so, that's why what I do is church history. You know? And I also don't like the adjective there either. You know, you know, church history as if there's some other category of history. It's all church. It's all redemptive history. It's all Christ's. And um, uh, so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a totality of what we are and what we're doing. Um, Oh, those are great distinctions. And I'm going to try to be more mindful of the words that I use in, in the descriptors. So thank you for that. I, that's really, really impactful. So, you know, you've written more than 30 books, which is a lot, which, you know, takes work as you were alluding to, you know, with Benjamin Franklin, you know, pulling those words and, and doing the research and, and the writing, it is work. Um, so 30 books is, is very impressive. Um, so how have you seen God at work throughout your writing journey? Well, I know as I was writing that first book, and I was only halfway through it when I got the that phone call after eight days, you know, sending out a sample chapters and a synopsis and so forth. <clears throat> and then I'm like, and they said, how soon can you be done? And I'm like, well, I don't know, you know, how soon can I be done? I haven't done this before. I don't know. You know, I don't know what the last chapter is going to look like. It, but um, um, uh, So anyway, it, I mean, I've seen the Lord at work in so many ways. Some of them are really hard. I tell my writing students, I told my classroom students, but now my Oxford Creative Writing Master class is such a wonderful week um, of just really going close, right where it all happened there with so many great writers, Tolkien, Lewis, obviously, and so many others. Um, but I, I tell them, if you want to write well, you're going to have to suffer. Mm. Just going to be honest, you're going to have to suffer. And um, I mean, the Apostle Paul told us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And it's going to cost you uh, to be a writer because we can't, we can't empathize with our readers unless we've actually been through that furnace um, in some way. And, it, and everybody's going to go through that furnace, whatever, whatever. There's different furnaces out there. But all of them should make us more empathetic about the sufferers in those furnaces. And um, so I think that's that's a principal way. It's painful, and I sometimes ask God, why, why am I having to suffer in this way with this other layer on top of it, and then this other layer on top? I can make one layer or two, but why these other layers of suffering and affliction? And uh, I think it's I think, and I know <laughs> it's because I, He wants to teach me things that there's no other way I can. You know, and um, so I want that to be reflected in my writing. I want to write with truth, but also with empathy and with compassion uh, for my reader, for my antagonist, you know, even. You know, it's one of the things Tolkien does so well with Gollum, you know. Sometimes we feel really sorry for Gollum, you know. And we're thinking, no, Gollum is a slime ball, you know, what do you think, you know. But, but he's right, you know. Mm -hmm. Recognize that the backstory for all of us is uh, would end in Gollum for me if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God in Christ. And um, so I guess back to what I was about to say, uh, everything I write, I want to be ultimately redemptive, ultimately, um, you know, whether it's whether I, I don't I never want to be preachy. I, I, I do have characters who are pedantic and who want to come in there and, you know, fix everybody else's problems, their Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, all rolled into one. Um, um, but, but those aren't my principal uh, voices. Uh, uh, the principal voices in there are going to be usually a minor character, somebody who's Im imperfect, but is, who's faithful. I can think of so many that have been so much delight to create and um, down through these books. and um, But ultimately, I want to give my reader, Christian or otherwise, and I hope that 
um, non-Christians will read uh, my books. I have no interest in crossing over, becoming, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I would love to have unbelievers read my books because my goal is to create longing for this all to be fixed. It's a mess. It's a broken mess. And uh, my unbeliever who's reading the story, um, you know, may for a while be the person that the psalmist is thinking about in the opening chapter, verses of Psalm 73. Why are they prospering and I'm suffering so much? You know, they're fat. They're, there's no, no suffering for them. Everything's going hunky dunk. But look at me. I'm a mess. What's going on here? You know, have I kept my hands clean, my heart pure for nothing? You know, mm. we, we get that way. And it's, it's, I'm so thankful for Psalm 73. Mm. Um, and I, I want to write with a sense, like my good friend Ian Hamilton says, he's a Scot, so he says it really uh, memorably, but, you know, that most of us don't need criticism. Uh, we don't need somebody to shout at us. We don't need somebody to put us down. We need encouragement. Most of us are in trouble most of the time in some form or another. So I try to write with a sense that the person reading this is in trouble. Believer or unbeliever, they're in trouble. They've got something. Or if they're not in trouble now, they're going to be. Um, and uh, I, I want to write in such a way that it gives them longing for the, for the Redeemer, for it all to be fixed. For all the um, pain and suffering and brokenness to be fixed, it's all going to be, all the untrue things are going to be put to rights. He promises that. So I want to give my reader longing for that. I want them to feel it. I want it to ache in their bosom that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. How can it be fixed? So I write like that. I guess Lewis has said something in, a, in an essay he wrote for um, on writing about writing for children. It's a great essay. I just, oh, it's on my reading list for Oxford. Um, and he says, you know, one of the things he says in is, don't write what you think your reader wants. You know, that'll make you look at the trend machine. That'll make you write for a moment, but you won't write anything that endures. Because the trend machine is always changing. Don't write what you think your reader needs, because that makes you pedantic and preachy. I'm gonna tell you, uh, uh, here's your problem, and here's how you fix it. You know, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You know, yes. Well, well, the, the three points are, are um, and that he says, write what you need. Well, what do I need? I need Jesus. I need. Yeah, you know, the brokenness of life to be healed and and made new and uh, all the things that Christ does. And he, he, he does it, he, he doesn't do it by um, ending all of our affliction. You know, the three, you know, Israeli ref refugees in the fiery furnace, he didn't take them out of the fiery furnace, not at first. He joined them in it. He came into the furnace. I want my reader to long to know Jesus better or to know him at all if they haven't met him. And um, the best way to do that isn't to preach to him. I mean, like, preaching is a great thing. That's, a, that's the genre that God's ordained, proclamation of truth. But I'm not first and last a preacher. I preach from time to time. Actually, I, I call it exhort. I don't, uh, but, but, um, I mean, how did Jesus preach? You know, mm -hmm. He told the truth. Yeah. You know, he told and he the told them in stories. He did it in stories mm -hmm. all the time. Some, some preachers say, well, never use illustrations or never use certain kinds of illustrations. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't get the memo on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that um, storytelling is really, really important. It's a big gaping hole in our seminaries. Mm. I'm going to say I, I, I hesitate to use superlatives, but I think it's a big gaping hole in okay, almost all of our seminaries. Yeah. 
it was sort of a disparaging. I remember at, being at, at CBA, they called it that then, but uh, you know, ICRS, the um, uh, which publishers publishers release books at these, and and independent publishers can join and present and and uh, introduce books, and they they sit down at the table with dis distributors and with. Uh, Bookstore owners, there's still some bookstore owners out there, uh, yes. brick and mortar. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and um, I remember a, a fella coming up and asking about one of my books being released. I don't know if it's Hostage Lands or Hand of Vengeance or one of those early, early Britain uh, tales. <clears throat> and, uh, and he said, oh, is that fiction? He says, you know, I, I'm in seminary. I just don't have time to read fiction. And uh, I, I just don't have time to. I've got, you know, all these other things to read. You know? And, um, you know, I think, I don't know if you've heard of T. David Gordon's book, Why Johnny Can't Preach. No. Great book. And in it, he makes the argument. Uh, I think he's retiring. Uh, he's emeritus at Grove City. Now, not that I'm supposed to be, you know, puffing any particular institution, but <clears throat> it's where Carl Truman is right now, too. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it's... Uh, he makes the point that one of the reasons why Johnny can't preach is that Johnny doesn't read great literature. He doesn't read the classic literature, whether po poetry and prose mm -hmm. uh, and epic and all that has you know, really defined the soul of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know the soul of Western civilization and he's going to step into the pulpit and preach to that or preach to some other civilization in another part of the world. And he doesn't yeah. know their story. Yeah. It's a huge gaping hole. They don't know poetry. One of the reasons why, in my judgment, we have some of the problems we've had in the what used to be called the worship wars is that we're a post-poetry world. We haven't realized that so much of what we're singing is really vacuous, banal poetry to start with. You know, it's just not good poetry. And if we had been immersed in the great poetry of our of our life, who we are, um, we'd have seen it. We'd have seen it coming. And we just said, whoa, I'm not going to offer that to the eternal living God in worship. You know, who made us poets, who communicated to us in vast poetry throughout the scriptures, in imaginative literature. Scriptures are full of imaginative literature. Why are our seminaries empty? of imaginative literature such it's a great game. questions and such great perspectives and um you touching on Everybody poetry says that about what i say to Lynn, I think, well, i like you but. No, but it's so true i mean it gets me thinking in ways that i haven't before and i think some of our listeners will, will find that true as well um and there's so much more that i would love to talk to you about in, in this vein um because of your vast experience and knowledge in this field but for today's episode I also wanted to give our listeners some practical tips um, and wanted to focus on your belief that all writing should be creative writing. And um, the listeners here are comprised of all different um, genre of writing. And so I thought this would be very relevant. Um, so first, if you could just, in your words, define creative writing for us. I'm so glad you asked this. <laughs> Um, you know, we are made in the image of God, our creator. And when we look around the the world, I was just listening this morning as I woke up out the window and, and some of the trees are hearing these incredibly beautiful bird songs. You know, God could have made one bird song. He could have made just, you know, uh, this bird does its job, blah, blah, blah. He made hundreds, thousands of different birds and different songs that they sing. Life is like that. And so God, our creator, created. I mean, the birds are just one thing. You know, think about the trees in the garden. You know, all those different trees, all the different fruit. You know, so many different things. We, we could have taken a protein pill. No, he's given us all these glorious yeah. And then, and then all these different traditions and the various cuisine, and then what a new tradition, you know, what what Americans have done to pizza, you know, worst pizza I ever had was in Rome, you know, what the, you know, or 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 other foods, you know, that that you know, a new another culture gets, you know, meshed with, and then does more wonderful things with that food. God made us to create, 
why do we think we should stop creating when we put pen to paper, whatever our genre? I mean, when I when I would uh, I would teach essay writing. Essay writing, I think, is one of the most important foundational tools for young people to learn to write well, to write creatively. You know, nobody. What does Lewis say? And uh, I think it's uh, I think it's in um, uh, the horse and his boy. You know, Arvis begins to speak and tell a story, and she enters into this whole mode of voice and and all tone and everything and it's you know and and he says something to the effect about how uh different that is from the essay writing of most boys you know the difference is that nobody really wants to hear the hear you read your essay out loud you know you know <laughs> they like that story or that poem or that song or whatever but they don't really want to hear your essay i wanted kids to write essays that actually would be riveting and compelling so in the introduction to those so thinking of, and this applies to blog posts, this applies to devotional writing, this, to, this applies to practical theology, to all of these different um, nonfiction categories. It applies to academic writing, I think, <laughs> though nobody mm -hmm. in the, the academy seems to be say, thinking so, or very few. Um, but uh, one of the categories of the introduction, and I'll just, I, I'm not going to unpack all this, but is that you, you need to create a need to read. There has to be a need to read. And that means I've got to create that. I've got to figure out who's my reader. How can I connect to them creatively so that I awaken not only their eyes and their mind, but I awaken their imagination. We're made in the image of God. He's a creator. We have been given creativity. We have been given this phenomenon in us as human beings of imagination. And we need to appeal to that. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's why Johnny can't preach. And there's a lot of Johnnies out there that, well-meaning, they get the theology right. They get the facts there. They got it all there. Not all of them, by the way. But, you know, even when they do, they're not awakening the imagination of the listener. The most compelling sermons, the most compelling essays, the most compelling blog posts, the most compelling nonfiction books on various topics. But time management books, whatever it is, are going to connect to the creativity and the imagination of the reader. So all writing is, is really, before the face of God, has to be creative and imaginative writing. Because God, our maker, is creative and imaginative. Yes, he's made us each unique. And, you know, the, the buzzword these days is, you know, write in your own voice. Right. And I think that is exactly that unpacks the voice very well, what you just said. Um, we need to have a network of others because your voice is not the same as my voice. Exactly. And readers need to hear your voice, you know, not just my voice. Right. And um, I think that's really important. Yes. So now you write a lot of historical fiction as well. So how can a person creatively tell the truth with fiction? Yeah. I mean, there, there's this sense that fiction is, is uh, not true, you know, that it's somehow a fabrication, that it's an alternate to truth. And some fiction is. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging fantasy at all. I think fantasy is a marvelous genre. It's, it's not the genre that I'm drawn to personally, but it's, I don't think it's an illegitimate genre at all. But, um, but what I mean by uh, telling truth of fiction as a primary, you know, primary, most of my books are historical fiction, um, the majority of them, but uh, there, are those, there are others, but uh, um, I think it's, um, it, the characters have to be authentic, they have to be drawn truthfully. Even the fictional characters, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, as a historical fiction writer, one of the things I'm doing, I'm doing it in two different areas right now, um, is I'm reading widely in, you know, whether that's Pacific Theater World War II or whether that's 14th century Bohemia in Prague, you know, um, Anna Bohemia, um, it, it, you know, is, um, you know, I, I have to, I'm looking for that, that character that's maybe mentioned, I do this in the Hobgoblins on my, my historical fiction on, on John Bunyan, my most recent release. Um, Bunyan mentions in his Grace Abounding, the Chief of Sinners, um, which is his spiritual autobiography, he mentions a childhood cut up, blaspheming friend of his named Harry. 
That's the only mention of it, period. And he mentions it much later when he's talking to him as an adult and, and Harry is not a believer. He's stayed the course that God rescued John Bunyan out of. And um, Bunyan is calling him to repentance and to find freedom in Christ. And all that he's longing for in his blasphemy is fulfilled in Christ. Um, the opposite of blasphemy, worship on your face. And, um, and so I take and create Harry. And then the childhood episodes that we do know about from Bunyan, I have he and Harry doing them together. And then, you know, so I'm always looking for that. William, William Tidd, uh, a real historical character in the Battle of Seattle back in the mid, the mid 19th century Puget Sound Indian Wars. He was, a, he was a dispatch writer for the Washington Territory Militia. Perfect lens because he's moving from one unit to the other. He's carrying messages from one unit to the other. He knows what's going on in the woods over here and he's got it. So we don't know very much about him, but I, I unpack him and give him flesh and blood in the conflict. I give him, he's got a conflict. He's in trouble too. He's got great problems, family issues. Uh, he's an, an adult uh, uh, brother taking care of a younger sister, and there's no mom and dad. We don't know why until later in the story. Um, you know, they're there. Um, you know, my Crown and Covenant trilogy, uh, there, there's a mention of three or four local men who came to the res rescue of this Greer guy that was about to be roasted on a gridiron by the Redcoats. I give flesh and blood and names and problems and issues to those three or four men that came to his rescue. And that escalates into six books, basically two trilogies. Um, that's what you're always looking for. You want to weigh in. You want a lens. And the, the, you're telling truth. You're telling them in, in historical fiction, there is real history going on. Yes. And there has to be. And you can't tamper with the history just for fun. You know, the history is real. But you can create authentic fictional characters who can be your lens to seeing, understanding, and experiencing that history. Mm -hmm. uh, entering into it yourself. The best thing for uh, a, a writer of historical fiction is to think about wanting their reader to become a character in the story. They're mm -hmm. so caught up in the story that they begin to identify with you know, your protagonist or maybe your minor characters along with that protagonist. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's my goal as I'm creating that, is I want my reader to be in the story. Mm -hmm. And they can't put it down. Then I can invest mm -hmm. in ever-ready batteries because, you know, back in the days when you used to be able to do it, now you just do it with your phone, right? Whatever. I don't yes. know, you know, under the pillow. I used to do that all the time. I'm under the pillow, you know, with the with my book, with the flashlight, you know. And my parents, you know, they knew, right? They knew. And do they, do they you know, that's one of those indulgences. They say, yes. you, know, you need to go to bed on time, you know. Mm, but if he's reading for another hour, you know, that's all good, you know. <laughs> Oh, those are great explanations. What a great goal, too, as a historical fiction writer. Um, and I, Before we end, I wanted to touch on one more aspect of writing, and you touched on it a little bit earlier, but about poetry. And I agree that it is not discussed very much at all these days or read widely. Um, and, you know, I think everyone would agree that poetry is primarily based on creativity, Um yet it needs to be balanced with, you know, foundational principles. And you have developed what you call the push-ups of prose. And I didn't know if you wanted to share one or two of those with our listeners. Oh boy. You know, that's a, that is a kind of a sub point under my, um, my uh, C4 explosive mm -hmm. writing, you know, it, it's a series of uh, addresses on, on, um, you know, how do we write explosively so that, you know, we come into the room and, you know, everybody has to reckon with what's going on in this story. You know? um, <clears throat> because it's so compelling. It's so the most important thing at the moment. How do I do that? And one of the things about, you know, well, let me give you an example. C.S. Lewis considered himself a poet. His first book published was when he was 19 by Heinemann uh, Company in Britain. Um, and um, he writes about seeing that book there at Blackwell's in Oxford and what it made him feel like and think about as he pulled his own book off the shelf and he didn't see C.S. Lewis as the name. 
he did that on purpose because he wasn't know if, he didn't know it was going to be a success. So he took his his mother's maiden name, uh, and and uh, it was Clive Hamilton. And he wrote it was a good move. It was spirits and bondage. It was uh, a lot of really angry poetry he wrote in the trenches, of World War One. My book, War in the Wasteland, is that C.S. Lewis is actually the antagonist in that book. He's a angry, bitter teen atheist uh, second lieutenant in the Somerset Light Infantry, platoon leader in the trenches. And I give flesh and blood to a private in the trenches. He's a dog handler and so forth. Anyway, um, it um, Lewis considered himself a poet, but Spirits in Bondage didn't end up being up there with Siegfried Sassoon or Wilfred Owen some of the great poets of World War I. Partly, I think it's because he was um, was so arrogant in it. You know, you read some of it, you know. Um, <clears throat> and also it was this, there was this incredible disconnect with his atheism because he's writing poetry, some of it, to God and blaming God, shaking his fist at the heavens, you know about all the horror that he had seen. There's a certain inauthenticity to claiming to be an atheist <clears throat> and then, but needing to create a God that you can blame because we're certainly not gonna blame human beings for this. You know? And so I think there's some reason. There's some of the poetry that's, that's really quite, quite good, quite searching, but a lot of it is kind of like, okay, you know, well, it, it ended up being a, a, a flop. His next book was also poetry, Diamond, and it was also a flop. And he was wise enough to not use C.S. Lewis on it. <laughs> so I guess my point is this, that <clears throat> Lewis did become, I think, one of the great, I'm, I'm reading his book very slowly because I'm, I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not on his level of his tone of life. This, you know, I, yesterday afternoon, evening, I was reading, uh, Miracles by C.S. Lewis, and he has he has so many categories I don't even have. You know, as I'm reading it, it's like, uh, you know, I really wish I knew what he was talking about. Having to go back and reread it, and and really get in there. The reason Lewis was able to write the searching prose, uh, Problem of Pain, is the one that really put him on the radar. Um, in, in the early days in his writing, it was only later that he wrote Narnia, the Narnia, seven Narnia books and <clears throat> and uh, Space Trilogy and, and those, those things and Screwtape Letters and Mere Christianity and all the broadcast talks. They, you know, took, took those all together to make the uh, Mere Christianity. But, um, but the reason he was able to write so imaginatively I and mean, with such creativity and use compelling illustrations to draw you in and help you to understand what he was trying to communicate is because of the push-ups of prose that he did. He was writing poetry all the time. He was writing poetry in Latin, in Latin verse. And here's the thing, the, the thing, we have to put air quotes around poetry because in our egalitarian individualistic moment in the history of literature, art, beauty, and so forth, and truth, um, we say that poetry is anything I say poetry is. I can, I can fragment my prose. I know some pretty good people who do this sometimes in their weekly devotions, but I can fragment my prose and put them in these arbitrary lines as if they're poetry, but it's really just fragmented prose. But it looks kind of cool like poetry, you know, but it's not really poetry. There are certain parameters that make something poetry in various people have various ways of drawing those parameters, but <clears throat> but with with my teaching poetry for many many years, I um, people would criticize sometimes and say, well, you know, why don't you let your your students write in in you know in in free verse? And I said, mm -hmm. oh, I do, I do. We just call it brainstorming. Mm -hmm. We're not done yet. Uh, what did what did Robert Frost say? Because he was a he was a traditionalist writing in the twentieth century. And he got criticized by the imagists and all those people who said, you know, break all the rules, yeah. just let it all hang out. You know, it's it's basically your poetry is an, a, an emotional striptease and you just, you define what it's supposed to be. And Robert Frost says, you know, uh, writing poetry that doesn't rhyme is like playing tennis with the net down. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I, I don't think Frost would say that as an absolute. There is uh, free verse poetry. 
that's the result of a very mature poet who's done all of the spade work and submitted themselves to form. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're doing. You know, the the average well-meaning new convert, youthful guy with a guitar in the garage who's creating worship music, who has no theological training, no literary training, no poetic understanding, power of of metaphor and uh, and really is pretty pretty nascent in his understanding just of the bible but he's he's writing the worship lyrics that we're supposed to take back to god raised up somebody like david asaph and others to write under the inspiration of the holy spirit the mad, most magisterial hebrew poetry ever written or the prophets so much of the prophets were writing in poetry poetry they were writing in hebrew poetry um and there's form and there's order and there's structure and you have to submit to that form we're not exactly a moment in the history of humanity that likes to submit to form oh. not a bit and so i would say if you really want to become a good prose writer whether you'll ever have anything published in poetry whether you'll ever uh, you know Write a hymn that some people that other people will want to sing and worship that'll be included in a in a hymnal and so forth. What, what's that? What's a hymnal? You know, I, I you know, <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's no vetting needed. You know, all I have to do is create something in the garage, get it to the tech guys, they put it on a PowerPoint, we're good to go. You know, it's no vetting. It's nobody, nobody's stopping, slowing the process down and saying, wait, is this really worthy hmm. of the eternal infinite creator God? whose praises we're singing. He made us to create. He made us to create with excellence. He gives us models of what that looks like. Right. Are we submitting to form? As English speakers, we have this incredible tradition, poetic tradition. It's vast. I've been studying it for decades of my life, and I feel like I've only scratched the surface. I plan to keep studying it, reading it, taking it in till the day I die. Um, but, you know, we, if you really want to write prose well, I've, I have so many people say, oh, I want to write a book. Um, I say, you know, have you read some poetry? Oh, I don't like poetry. You know? Well, what do you mean by poetry? And usually they show me something that doesn't make sense, like so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Wow. I'm blown away. I want to be a poet too. They're saying, what? Does that mean? I remember in, in high school, you know, high school English class, hearing some of this and just thinking, why doesn't he just say it? You know, <laughs> uh, I, at that point, particular moment in my, you know, Philistine meathead imagination, I wanted, I wanted a, a you know, a grocery list of to dos, you know. Mm. And um, I, I had, I, I was not even at the very first step of even with all the stuff my mom read me, you know, that was all groundwork. That didn't come to fruition until I did some maturing, which I really needed to do. I still need to do. But um, um, it's, um, the, it is the push-ups of prose. And I, I would just urge somebody who wants to write a book, you know, go back to the rudiments of your imagination. Go back to what God made us, to, to how God communicates with us. Um, in story and in poetry, this this higher register language that that augments us, that lifts us above the ordinary speech. There's a reason for that. I mean, we just saw the you know the um, funeral of of Queen Elizabeth II. You know, they weren't they weren't singing Three Dog Night at Westminster Abbey. You know. Um, they were singing something else. Why is that? Oh, it was just a preference because she was old. No, it's not just a preference because she was old. It's augmented speech that's the only thing appropriate. Augmented singing that's the only thing appropriate for such a high register moment, mm -hmm. which we have week by week on the Lord's Day. That's a high register moment. It's the high watermark of the week from creation. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't create something that looks like something else that's popular right now. The entertainment stage, the rock concert, you know, a football stadium, 
We, we, we don't want the augmented. We don't want the high register. We want the common. And poetry will uh, confront that desire. We need it more than ever. We're in a post-poetry world. Yes. Absolutely post-poetry world. But that means we need it all the more. It means we have more work to do to get back to where we were because we don't even, we've lost categories needed to be able to even understand poetry, you know? And um, anyway, that's not a short answer to your, your no, question. but that is so good. And I just, um, I'm just really, you know, motivated right now to dig into okay, writing. And um, I really believe that the, everything that you've shared, um, is, you know, I know at least one portion of what you've shared has resonated with our each and every listener. Um, you've shared so much, and I so appreciate your time and um, your wisdom and experience and of your faith. So thank you so much for all of that. And I know that many of our listeners will want to learn more about you. So can you please share how they can connect with you? Yes, thanks. I mean, um, uh, bondbooks.net. Not dot com. That'll take you to all the James Bond stuff. <laughs> Bondbooks.net uh, will get you to my site and you'll learn about um, <clears throat> uh, writing opportunities. I'm, I'm blogging there. I, um, uh, you know, I have study guides for homeschool families and all of that that go along with so many of the books on historical fiction as well as nonfiction books. And um, uh, there's all the books that are available there as well for. Uh, Lots of people come to the site for signed gift books and things like that too, and and uh, and then you also learn more about my uh, master classes, my creative writing master classes, um, and uh, love to have you join them. They're small groups; they fill up quickly. There's not a lot of space. Oxford, we only we only can take a mass total of nine people, including me. Oh, wow! So it's a very intimate week. We're really going close. People bringing what they're writing. We're doing lots of critique together. You know, we're doing it on location in these marvelous places where Wycliffe wrote and translated scripture and where, you know, so many, so many great so original Hebrew wrote holy, 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 and so many other of his great poems. We don't think of it, but hymns first started as poems. You know? And um, uh, anyway, there's just uh, so many things and where Tolkien wrote, where Lewis wrote, um, and I uh, just saturating ourselves in that history. And it's a literary tour of Middle England. Uh, we go to Bedford, Elstow, where Bunyan wrote the classic, you want to get it. And you know, Bunyan's writing poetry in that. Every episode in Pilgrim's Progress ends with a encapsulating poem. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, so many people don't actually read the uncut on a bridge, 1678, Pilgrim's Progress. But there were no chapters. There didn't need to be because he would encapsulate, this is neoclassical at the time, there were more neoclassical writers were doing this. He would in encapsulate his, um, that episode in Pilgrim's Progress with a poem. The hill though high I covet to ascend, the difficulty will not me offend, for I perceive the way to life lies here, come block apart. No, I won't go into that. But, um, you know, every, every episode ends that way. Um, and you see how Bunyan became, Bunyan wrote the great English classic by being a poet. He's not a great poet, but there are, there are some point, points where he's great, but he was, he was the prose writer of this language, you know, step aside everybody else, you know. So anyway, there's, a, there's all that, Hobgoblins, I guess a pitch for that book right now. It's, um, uh, it was a delight to, to write that book. Uh, and, um, and then of course, our church history tours. I know that's for another topic, maybe uh, another time. Yes. But um, you know, the um, we just we just finished in June, end of June, the uh, early church in the British Isles tour, and it was so earthy, and uh, we were on Hadrian's Wall, and we were up in Iona, where Saint Columba brought uh, the Christian gospel from Patrick's Ireland to you know the generation or century later to Scotland, and mm. then it worked its way down. There was no connection to Rome or anything. Um, and so we went to all these places, then we went across the Irish Sea, and we went to all these wonderful places there. It's just, it's a marvelous time of fellowship together. We do a lot of singing. <laughs> we, um, we do uh, just a lot of eating, really, really good food, and, and all. And so the Rome to Geneva trip's coming up. Um, um, we've done this one before. It's a marvelous trip. It, it is getting, I was getting inquiries about it before I even announced that we were going to do it. Um, it's so nice to be back up after the COVID lockdown. <laughs> 
I mean, it was just, it was horrible for me, you know, to be locked down and no Oxford class and no, no uh, uh, church history uh, tours and things too. But, but I've been leading these church history tours since 1996. Uh -huh. And it's just so much, um, so much, so much fun. And, and uh, you know, I didn't learn my, my church history from Wikipedia. And, you know, I, I learned it from being there, from reading the primary sources. And, all. and it's such a delight to get to know people who live in those places, who become friends sure. Um, you know, Julia Cameron, she's a, she's a, you know, she's a, she's, you know, such an accomplished um, writer and publicist there in Oxford and a dear Christian woman, very uh, good friends with uh, John Stott and all. And, you know, she meets with us every time we're there and we go through the private library of uh, Merton College, which nobody gets to go through unless you're a student there. And it's just so much fun and I think so stimulating to uh, you know the aspiring writers some of them are already published I mean I have you know you, you probably know the name Tim Challies you know Tim and his son Nick went on the Oxford Creative Writing Masterclass and, uh, and he told me ahead of time you know we we're both speaking at a Ligonier conference and he says you know um, I've written these nonfiction books but I've got an idea for a fiction book and I need help you know <laughs> and uh, and uh, so anyway but um uh, so I guess I've covered that pretty well. Yes. Net, not dot com. You don't want to maybe maybe you do want to read about um, uh, James Bond. I don't know, but but uh, the other Bond, um, you know, at bondbooks.net. So. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> yes, everyone, be sure to visit bondbooks.net. All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.